Hey there, my name is Alex. I am the Silverwind. And here are five beginner tips for Dragon's Dogma 2. I based most of these off looking at reviews, early impressions, and people discussing the game online. So whilst they may seem fairly obvious, hopefully they'll help some of you out. And let's get to it. And first up, not a real big point, but I just want to say that you can safely ignore all of the microtransactions for this game. All of those in-game items can be earned in-game. It's not worth buying them. At the end of the video, I'll briefly touch on performance as well for PC players. First up, Dragon's Dogma 2 currently has one save file, much like the first game. And there are two main types of save in the game. Auto saves and in checkpoints. The game will frequently auto-save, and if you choose to save from the menu, this is the same type of save, so it will overwrite your auto-save. Every time you rest at an inn or your home, if you've bought one, it creates an inn checkpoint. When you load or reload the game, you can choose the auto-save or the inn checkpoint. Camping does not count as an inn checkpoint. The primary use for an inn checkpoint might be if you go too far or get into too dire a situation and you need to roll back. Still, it's useful to make fairly frequent use of these, as you never know what will happen. You can get a house which allows free sleeping and pawn updating early in the game. Once you reach the city, you can either find an NPC in the poorer part of town who wants you to look after her house for a week, after which she'll ask if you want to buy it for 20,000 gold. Alternatively, in the Noble District, an NPC will offer to sell you a fancy house for 200,000. And you may find other houses available to you as you progress further into the game. Dragon's Dogma wants you to commit to changes, so you aren't going to be safe scumming a lot in most scenarios. But if you understand how the save systems work, that'll prevent needless headaches for you. Oh, and Capcom have said they are planning on putting a new game function in so you can start a new character in the future. Pawn inclinations from the first game have been simplified. You choose a personality for your pawn. A straightforward pawn will focus on fighting. A simple pawn will pick up items more frequently. The impacts in combat are not as drastic as the first game, at least to my eye so far. But bear in mind it took a long time to work out all the exacts of inclinations in the first game, how to influence them, how to change them. This time they don't seem to change. There's no more if you use this function a lot it will make your pawn more likely to become a mendicant or a scather for example. But also keep in mind you can change your pawn's personality with items from the vendors next to the giant rift stone in the cities for rift crystals. Rift crystals are earned through gameplay and also primarily from your pawn being hired and used by other players. Certain classes do seem to match certain personalities or inclinations rather well though. For example, a kind-hearted mage will heal you more than a simple mage, but a simple mage can still be commanded to heal you at almost any time with the help me command, and they will still heal you in combat. If a pawn makes a suggestion to you, such as I know where some treasure is, or I have a skill to reach that area. You can hit the go command and they will carry it out. Personally, I think simple is very well suited to archer and thief pawns in particular, as it's nice to have someone grab items you may have missed. If you recruit other pawns from beyond the rift, keep in mind that you can use them as storage. You can put excess items on them, and if that pawn, say, dies or drowns and is lost to you, don't worry, those items will be sent to your storage automatically. Whilst you can have them hold equipment, if you equip an item onto a pawn that does not belong to you, it will be lost to you. For example, if you summon my pawn and you equip a different sword on him, he will bring it back with him and you will lose it. Pawns that do not belong to you will not level up in your world. Again, for example, say you summon my pawn at level 10 and then you've reached level 20. He won't level up with you. However, you can dismiss him and resummon him, and if, for example, in the meantime I have leveled him up, he will now be a higher level. Friend pawns cost no rift crystals to recruit, because usually if you recruit a pawn at a higher level than your own, it will cost you rift crystals. So generally speaking, you should stick to pawns that are your level or below, or just summon a friend's pawn. <laughs> pawns also have specializations they can unlock now. 
such as a pawn knowing how to use healing items on other party members, or marking items on the map, or combining items automatically. You'll probably want a diverse set of pawns, each bringing different specialization. So far, I'm quite enjoying the combination of a logistician, forager, and the... I have actually forgotten what it's called, the one that can use healing items. And again, keep in mind, for them to use the healing items, they have to physically come up and touch you. So, if you're a ranged class, then it might be better to have that on a ranged pawn. But again, it's not a huge difference. I've noticed most people so far are tending to combine their kind-hearted mages with that to make it like an all-in-one healer. Either way, if you have one of those pawn specializations, it's a really good idea to put all your sort of antidotes on them, you know, things that cure poison and status ailments, because then they will use them automatically when they need to. As for the pawn inclinations or personalities themselves, simple pawns will enjoy opening treasure chests and picking up more items. Straightforward pawns will focus a little more on combat and they will go a little bit further away from you. Calm pawns are a little bit more defense oriented in that they will be slightly less offensive, but I've not really seen how that plays out in combat so far. I started my pawn as straightforward and then swapped him to calm and I've not noticed a huge difference so far. However, I'll also point out that I didn't put any defensive abilities on my pawn, as I tend to think those are often, in the first game, they were a waste of time, because the pawns were so good at perfect blocking and stuff. Kind-hearted pawns will stick closer to the Arisen, and they will focus a bit more on healing if they have healing abilities. Moving on, Dragon's Plague. This is the biggest complaint I've seen, along with performance. Pawns will talk about Dragon's Plague a lot, from my experience. How they've heard tales of pawns coming back from the rift, growing surly, inobedient, and perhaps with more dire consequences. I won't really say exactly what happens with its culmination, but needless to say, it's something you probably want to avoid at all costs. And it's not super hard to avoid. Keep an eye out for the signs. Pawns who disagree or disobey commands, clutch their heads, and have red eyes. The exact mechanics are still unclear, but it seems pawns most likely contract Dragon's Plague from coming into contact or combat with draconic enemies. Perhaps from killing, perhaps from being grabbed, perhaps just from any contact. They can spread it to another pawn, curing themselves in the process. Either way, if you see the signs, it's best to dismiss the pawn. Or if it's your own pawn, perhaps casually shove them into the water and resummon them. If you see anything suspicious about any of your pawns, take precautions. One of your biggest tools in Dragon's Dogma 2's combat will be physics. Picking up objects in the environment and hurling them at your enemies can not only do a lot of damage, but can stagger them. Is a large monster off balance, you can grab their leg, push or pull them over. Certain enemies can be picked up and thrown off cliffs into the water. This all applies to the player as well. If you are staggered, you might knock your head into a wall or a ledge, or you might stumble off said ledge. And once you hit an enemy enough, you'll see a very distinct visual effect which marks them as being staggered. In this state, if they are roughly human sized, they can be grappled or thrown. You can also hit them with a critical attack. Fighters Impale, for example, will do insane damage on a staggered enemy. This works for knocked down larger foes as well. Take advantage of your surroundings. You can always make a griffin dive bomb into the water and kill itself, or have an ogre jump off a cliff. Many enemies will have specific weaknesses too, which often involves the physics in some way. Like griffins, set their wings on fire in any manner you can think of and watch them collapse. Finally, Unlike the first game, you can stand on enemies. If you climb on top of an enemy, you can then release your grip and stand there, which doesn't cost stamina, and allows you to regenerate some stamina so you can keep on climbing. But obviously, you're a lot more prone to being tossed off if it bucks wildly, or flies, or does a barrel roll, or anything like that. But Dragon's Dogma 2 follows nature, where one day a human picked up a rock and said, Sorry, Animal Kingdom, I'm about to end your whole careers with this. In other words, throwing rocks is very strong in this game. Now, finally, there's a few methods of travel in Dragon's Dogma 2. On foot, obviously. You generally don't want to travel at night because it's incredibly dark, making it hard to tell where you're going, even with a lantern. 
Strong enemies come out too, so it might be better to camp at night. You can travel at night, but again, that's up to you. Fast travel comes in two main forms. Ferry stones, which are single-use items which cost 10,000 gold each, can be found rarely in the world. If you see a vendor who's selling a ferry stone and you buy it, he will get another one in a few days at most. Now, these allow you to travel to any port crystal you have touched or placed. For example, you will find some permanent port crystals, for example in large settlements or cities. Make sure to touch them at least once. You can also find portable port crystals, which are extremely rare items. You will find a handful of them in the entire game. You can place them anywhere you want and ferry stone to them at will, assuming you have fairy stones. So think carefully about where you place them. You can pick them back up again at any time, so don't be afraid to put one down and then pick it up and move it somewhere else. And I'll try and give a spoiler-free sort of tip for port crystals. If you come across a an entity that asks you to hand over your most precious item in a very out-of-the-way kind of mountain shrine in the game. If you hand it over your port crystal, you may get an extra port crystal in exchange. Beyond this, there's ox cart travel. This costs very little, like 100 gold, 200 gold, which is nothing, and lets you doze off to effectively fast travel from an ox cart station to your destination. However, you can be raided on the way, and it's entirely possible that, say, a griffin will pop down, blow up the cart, and leave you stranded on foot in the middle of nowhere. And speaking of griffins, yes, if a griffin flies away from combat and you're atop it, you can stand atop it quite freely. So if you're, like, gripping onto it as it flies away, feel free to stand up if you're on its back and you will get a free trip to goodness knows where. I've had this happen only once so far, and I only had one fairy stone, so whilst part of me really was tempted to see how far it would take me, I had to brain the griffin and crash land into a riverbed, because I didn't want to be stranded in goodness knows where. Well, there's some tips, and uh, I invite you to share your tips in the comments down below. Finally, about performance on PC. Sadly, there's no magical cure right now. The game's main performance issues come from CPU utilization. So if you're thinking, oh, I need to upgrade my computer just because of this game, CPU's probably the main culprit that's uh, driving you demented. There are a few tips you can take advantage of, however. First up, if your CPU isn't the problem, and best way to test this is, well, either looking at your GPU usage or going into an area with like no NPCs, just seeing how frames hold up in the middle of, you know, a barren landscape. And if you're in that situation, shadows and SSAO ambient occlusions are probably the first thing you want to lower, along with resolution. This all has the highest impact on GPU performance from my testing. Next up, if you have a 40 series NVIDIA GPU, like me, you can enable frame generation and DLSS3. There's a link to it in the description. If your game goes red after you swap that like DLL file out, uh, just make sure you turn on NVIDIA latency or reflex, whatever it's called. Some people have said it made them crash. For me, I've not had any crashes from it. However, I also capped my frame rate to 60 because I do that for every game that I'm planning on ever making videos for. And it boosted my performance insanely. There's also mods on uh, Nexus mods, which attempt to do the same for 20 and 30 series NVIDIA GPUs. I can't speak for how useful they are, as I've not used them, but it's worth giving a shot. Just remember, if you're doing something like that, to back up anything you're replacing. For example, for the frame gen one that I'm using, you have to replace a DLL file. I would say make a backup of that on like your desktop. If you don't, and you have problems with the game in Steam, remember you can go to like verify game files. Hopefully, Capcom will patch the game, as the CPU utilization or whatever is a big problem right now, and these are just workarounds. Capcom need to optimize the game. Anyway, thanks so much for watching, and I hope you're having fun with the game. See you soon.